welcome back to the channel. This is a quick video to discuss the guidance that was referred to so many times during the debate uh, in the House of Lords on the amendment 297F and 297G amendments to the healthcare bill. And because this guidance was referred to, I thought it would be useful to create a little video resource just taking you through what this guidance actually says. So this is the guidance um, which was published in 2019. Let me just get it up here on my iPad so I can talk to you about it. Uh, so this um, there's a link in the description box so that you can read this guidance for yourself. Uh, it's actually called Delivering Same-Sex Accommodation, dated September 2019, and it's by NHS England and NHS Improvement. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through and, uh, you know, there's a whole lot of stuff about the breaches and what does it mean if, a, if a, an NHS trust has a breach. Um, but actually what we're going to look at is Annex B, which is on page 12 of the guidance. Uh, which is titled Delivering Same-Sex Accommodation for Trans People and Gender Variant Children. Let's have a little look. So we're looking at Annex B, Delivering Same-Sex Accommodation for Trans People and Gender Variant Children. I'm going to read this through because it's just a few pages, but it's so, so important that we know that this is what the NHS guidance has been telling our local NHS trusts to do. It says, transgender or trans is a broad inclusive term referring to anyone whose personal experience of gender extends beyond the typical experiences of their assigned sex at birth. It includes those who identify as non-binary. Okay, we're at the end of paragraph one and I've already got several issues with this <laughs> I'm not going to stop because otherwise we'll be here all day. So, Under the Equality Act 2010, individuals who have proposed, begun or completed reassignment of gender enjoy legal protection against discrimination. A trans person does not need to have had to be planning any medical gender reassignment treatment to be protected under the Equality Act. It is enough if they are undergoing a personal process of changing gender. In addition, good practice requires that clinical responses be patient-centred, respectful and flexible towards all transgender people, whether they live continuously or temporarily in a gender role that does not conform to their natal sex. It's explicitly saying that it doesn't matter whether you've taken no steps in your transition. It doesn't matter if you only identify as a woman called Belinda every several Tuesdays. Um, any time anybody states that they are transgender, they acquire that protected characteristic. Now, I am pretty sure that when the people drafted the Equality Act and wanted to balance all the different rights of all these different protected characteristics, they never intended the protected characteristic of gender reassignment to be accessible to absolutely everybody, even on a temporary basis for a couple of hours. No, protected characteristics are pretty permanent situations. They are not optional. So I resent that. It continues. This is a bullet pointed list now. Trans people should be accommodated according to their presentation, the way they dress and the name and pronouns they currently use. This may not always accord with the physical sex appearance of the chest or genitalia. It does not depend on their having a Gender Recognition Certificate, GRC, or legal name change. It applies to toilet and bathing facilities, brackets, except, for instance, that preoperative trans people should not share open shower facilities, close brackets. Views of family members may not accord with the trans person's wishes, in which case 
the trans person's view takes priority. How do you accommodate people based on presentation when presentation is an entirely temporary situation that you can just, you know, if you're in if you're in hospital and you're really sick and you're wearing a hospital gown and you're really sick, so you're not wearing any makeup, you're not doing your hair, there's nothing, there's, your presentation is entirely neutral. Whether you're male or female, your presentation is neutral. You're not giving any kind of indicators, social signals that you belong to one group or another group. You are purely presenting as a member of your sex. And that's what a member of your sex looks like when they're stripped down to wearing a hospital gown, no makeup, no hair done, and you're lying in a hospital bed because you're really, really sick. There, there, there is no presentation, the way they dress, the name and the pronouns they currently use. Unbelievable. It applies to toilets and bathing facilities. You know, there are specific exemptions in the Equality Act. I can't see how this guidance is, is compatible with the Equality Act. Anyway, it continues. Those who have undergone transition should be accommodated according to their gender presentation. Different genital or breast appearance is not a bar to this, since sufficient privacy can usually be ensured through the use of curtains or by accommodation in a single side room adjacent to a gender appropriate ward. This approach may be varied under special circumstances where, for instance, the treatment is sex specific and necessitates a trans person being placed in an otherwise opposite gender work ward. Such departures should be proportionate to achieving a legitimate aim, for example, uh, for instance, a safe nursing environment. So what they're saying there is that you should definitely, definitely accommodate somebody on a ward where they're surrounded by members of the opposite sex. But don't worry, because the curtains can protect their privacy. So if the curtains are sufficient to protect their privacy, why can't they protect their privacy on a ward with the other members of their biological sex? And it recognises that treatment is sex specific and necessitates a trans person being placed on an otherwise opposite gender ward, the maternity ward. It's not the birthing person's ward, it's the maternity ward. It's for mothers, it's for female patients that are giving birth to children. Anyway, this may arise, for instance, when a trans man is having a hysterectomy in a hospital or a hospital ward that is designated specifically for women and no side room is available. The situation should be discussed with the individual concerned and a joint decision made as to how to resolve it. In addition to these safeguards, where admission, triage staff are unsure of a person's gender, they should, where possible, ask discreetly where the person would be most comfortably accommodated. They should then comply with the patient's preference immediately or as soon as practicable. If patients are transferred to a ward, this should also be in accordance with their continuous gender presentation, unless the patient requests otherwise. See, that's not even, that is not even, that doesn't even make sense, even on its own terms. First of all, if a trans man needs a hysterectomy, which a lot of trans men do because taking testosterone will atrophy all of your reproductive organs and uh, they will become cancerous if they're left there um, forever and ever. So, you know, that is a normal situation that that pathway leads inevitably to hysterectomy. Um, if you need a hysterectomy and the ward that you need to be nursed on is a, a woman only ward, I would suggest that you're nursed on the woman only ward with the other women. Um, I would hope that hospitals are sensitive enough to the feelings of the other women on that ward when they could be presented with a with a person who is clearly, for those of us that are aware of transgenderism, a five foot two balding gnome like person is clearly not 
uh, male. But to some people, it might be distressing to see that person on the ward. So they might uh, agree to put them in a side room. And, um, you know, I think it's always a great idea if you get a side room. But what's all this about? You should comply with a patient's preference. What's preference got to do with it? You're so sick, you're in hospital. You don't get preferences, you get treatment. <laughs> be grateful. It's the NHS. It's free. It's free at the point of need. Be grateful. And this about the continuous gender presentation. This is a get out clause because you're in a hospital bay, you're wearing a hospital gown, you've got no makeup on, you've not done your hair. Therefore, you look like the sex that you actually are. You look like a sick male person or you look like a sick female person. You may look like a sick female person that has got evidence of masculine, uh, masculine, masculine, masculization. Or you may look like you're a male person that has had plastic surgery. So it's saying continuous gender presentation because it's saying that you may not look like what you're claiming as while you're in hospital. So what's that? How is that fair to everybody else on that ward? It continues. If on admission, it is impossible to ask the view of the person because he or she is unconscious or incapacitated, then in the first instance, inferences should be drawn from presentation and mode of dress. No investigation as to the genital sex of the person should be undertaken unless this is specifically necessary to carry out treatment. Well, I would go along with that. It's never, it's never a good... <laughs> of course, you shouldn't be looking at people's genitals if it's not medically indicated. I mean, that's basic. But the idea that you should make an inference based on the mode of dress of a person and not on their clearly observable biological sex, which we do not need to look at your genitals in order to be able to tell. <sighs> Continuing. In addition to the usual safeguards outlined in relation to all other patients, it is important to take into account that immediately postoperatively or while unconscious for any reason, those trans women who usually wear wigs are unlikely to wear them in these circumstances and may be read incorrectly as men. Extra care is therefore required so that their privacy and dignity as women are appropriately ensured. What a load of baloney. There are plenty of women that wear wigs. There are plenty of women that have balding, especially when they're elderly. None of those women are getting special attention in the hospital. You're sick. You're really sick. To get a hospital bed, you have to be really, really quite sick. Unless you're in for an elective procedure, in which case you've waited for years and years. But this is just bananas. You're, you're not read incorrectly as men. You are men. You're not read incorrectly as men. It's just that all the artifice is stripped away and we can see what you are more easily. Trans men whose facial appearance is clearly male may still have female genital appearance. So extra care is needed to ensure their dignity and privacy as men. <laughs> right. Their facial appearance is clearly that of a woman who has taken testosterone, first of all. So they have like the adolescent beard growth, but they still have the, the facial proportions of a female person. They still have the size of a female person. And they do have a female genital appearance and function because they are female. <laughs> and one of the implications of that is say you're um, confined to your bed and you have to urinate in your bed into some kind of a device, the actual shape of the device that you are given is different based on whether or not you've got an innie or an outie. So that like on a male ward, you're not even going to have any of those urinal bottles in stock. So you... <laughs> imagine the scene where you say, oh, well, yeah. um, Mr. Thomas in bed four needs a urinal bottle, please. Yeah, not that one. Not that one. The same as everybody else. The special ones that we brought from the hysterectomy ward. <laughs> Bananas. It says here, non-binary individuals who do not identify as being male or female should also be asked discreetly about their preferences 
and allocated to the male or female ward according to their choice. No, you don't get to choose which hospital ward you go in. You can't go in there with a with an appendix which is about to burst and say, yeah, but I want to go to the maternity ward. No, you go to the ward with everybody else whose appendixes are about to burst. Bananas. So trans men and non-binary individuals can become pregnant and should be treated with dignity while using maternity services. Absolutely agree. Further advice on providing services to trans people can be found in providing services for transgender customers on gov.uk. Can I just say the idea of customers in healthcare appalls me. It appalls me. I'm taking an extra breath because this is the, this is the bit that always gets me. Particular considerations for children and young people. Gender variant children and young people should be accorded the same respect for their self-defined gender as our trans adults, regardless of their genital sex. Where there is no segregation, as is often the case with children, there may be no requirement to treat a young gender variant person any differently from other children and young people. Where segregation is deemed necessary, it should be in accordance with the dress, preferred name and or stated gender identity of the child or young person. No, it shouldn't. Child safeguarding means that it shouldn't. In some instances, parents or those with parental responsibility may have a view that is not consistent with the child's view. Because they're adult. If possible, the child's preference should prevail, even if the child is not Gillick competent. So even if that child is not deemed competent to agree to medical procedures, i.e. they're not able to um, absorb the information, hold it in their brain and make a decision based on balancing the risks and benefits. Even if they're not at that stage of development, we should be going along with what they say. Even if their parents are saying, this is a recent thing. I mean, you know, maybe they've got a brain tumour or something that's making them think weirdly. You know, we should always, Occam's razor, it's a boy or it's a girl. Oh, goodness sake. More in-depth discussion and greater sensitivity may need to be extended to adolescents whose secondary sex characteristics have developed and whose view of their gender identity may have consolidated in contradiction to their sex appearance. It should be borne in mind that many trans adolescents will continue as adults to experience a gender identity that is inconsistent with their natal sex appearance, so their current gender identity should be fully supported in terms of the, their accommodation and use of toilet and bathing facilities. Because there's nothing dangerous about telling a girl who has complicated feelings about her body to go on a ward with a load of blokes. That's fine. It should be noted that although rare, Children may have conditions where genital appearance is not clearly male or female and therefore personal privacy may be a priority. You know what? The genital appearance of all children <laughs> is something that should remain private to everybody except for the medical personnel that are directly involved in care that directly results in a need to see those genitals. <laughs> Personal privacy is a priority for all children in hospital, particularly around their genitals. Come on. So that's Annex B. That's the guidance that the NHS has been working off. That's why we have a campaign to keep wards single sex. This is the guidance that we need the NHS to withdraw, amend, dismiss out of hand, we need Parliament to actually review how it interacts with the Equality Act and decide what they're going to do about it. So 
write to your MP, let him know that you're not happy that this guidance contradicts the Equality Act and that you have rights, you have right to sex segregated accommodation laid out in the Equality Act. This guidance means that the trust is not following the Equality Act. It's not, you can't make him, you can't make it match. One of them has to, to cede ground to the other. Who's, who's made this guidance? Because it doesn't actually say, oh, well, we asked a group of parliamentarians and they, they came up. No, it's another stonewall intervention, isn't it? It's another, we focus grouped with a bunch of trans activists and they came out with this and we agreed to everything they asked for. It's not a, it's not, it's not a proper political process to come out with guidance like that, that contravenes the law of the land and there's no information about who actually was consulted in the, in the making of this guidance. And nobody is prepared to stand up and say it was me. I, I authored that guidance. Outrageous. Outrageous liberties with our rights are being taken in the name of this ideology. So please get involved. Write to your MPs. Write to NHS England. Tell them that you're not happy. Do it before you need to go to hospital. Don't leave it to the sick people to try and fight this on their own. So, so thanks for watching the video. I hope you now feel educated about what is actually being said by the NHS. Please leave me a like or a dislike, share the love, Subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed already. If you want to help me out practically with this project of creating videos, my PayPal link is in the description box. We must keep wards single sex. We must. Please write to your MP. Write to the Lords that took part in the debate on Amendment 297F and 297G. Write to people, talk to people, let people know what's going on. Because people, when they know what's going on, are outraged. The problem is that we're not being told what's going on. So, I'll see you for the next video very soon.